Hey guys, uh, my name is Avery Rios. Uh, I'm a current graduate student of computer science at NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, I uh, am a graduate of Kenyon University um, in Union, New, New Jersey, um, and I studied political science and economics there. Um, and, and today, uh, I just want to uh, express my thoughts uh, on this. I, I want to read this essay for you um, that I have. Uh, it's called Technology and Post-Humanism. And uh, if, uh, if you guys like it, then, then hopefully it's good. All right, we're going to start. So, the 20th century caused classical liberal ideals to be seen as, in many ways, the chimera of the decade. Uh, the structuralist movement of the mid to late 20th century had found itself in, in quite, the, quite the quandary. Um, uh, as Foucauldian and Derridian schemas systematically attacked our fundamental tautological assumptions. The question that remained was this. What is exactly the locus of power described in the history of sexuality? Michel Foucault uh, proposed in the late 1970s that we as developed societies are under a Victorian regime of truth, a dominant, repressive, and coercively co-signatory process today. Um, today, even uh, a, a similar regime dominates us, um, and, the, and the ways in which we are dominated by discourses is more apparent now than ever before. The Foucauldian project, regardless of its historicity and the norms propounded within the domain of public discourse, seeks to intellectually liberate in the negative or categorizing by absence rather than presence of distinguishing features. This negative interpretation of power relations is a powerful methodology to systematically analyze institutions, social structures, and even scientific disciplines. In The Order of Things, an archaeology of the human sciences, Foucault proposes a particular idea called the episteme. This concept in a just most specifically means that uh, of how ordering and how taxonomy creates influential power structures that permeate through society. Foucault writes, I he, he was looking through creating the fundamental codes of a culture, those governing its language, its schemas of perception, its exchanges, its techniques, its values, the hierarchy of practices. In other words, the structures that organize and classify knowledge are limited by our own conceptual and intellectual purview. How do you think we ensure in the future that our representations of knowledge are true to reality as possible? How we, may we best direct our collective energy and labor as a society in order to fundamentally transform it in radical ways? How can we best move forward move scientific progress forward if we do not question our fundamental philosophical assumptions. Today, for example, the, the modern assumption in consumer society is that financial freedom is, in, ta in fact, a type of freedom. But what if this freedom was not a type of freedom at all? What if the act of participating in the market economy to become financially liberated, in fact, fetters one with iron shackles. As an introduction to my thought, I will explain the following. During my university studies, I've understood the realm of, the realm of ideas and intellectual history. And in order to come to be able to create new meaning or change in our current institutional hegemonies at a, a fundamental level. Initially, I'd been swayed by the persuasive power of literature. Um, precisely because literature mirrors 
our innermost humanity. Uh, I had delved into Nabokov, Faulkner, Hemingway, Mishima, George Eliot, uh, so many, so many great artists, and even so many modern ones. Uh, yeah, but, um, so, oh, okay, so I, I, I picked the authors I wanted to read precisely in terms of their difficulty. How else would I gain mastery over an art? Uh, Absalom, Absalom, for example, is, is known for having the longest sentence of all of, li in all of literature, uh, American literature, if even, uh, and is even more well known for, for being the most difficult book of the Nobel laureates au revoir. Um, within the work, an enigmatic stranger named Thomas Sutpen erected a mansion in Jefferson, Mississippi. Uh, the, power day, but the, the power dynamics of the book were, were very apparent. Um, it was not greed that, that, that drove Sutpen, but it was envy. Um, and his thirst for envy never absconded, um, and it has not left our world either, however, um, which is the, the substance of what continues to drive my intellectual project. Um, Envy of wealth, status, privilege, or possessions even, are, are, are all functions of status-seeking behavior. Um, so, as I became more adept at the craft, I trowed through the notoriously dense literature. I had sharpened my mind as a result and my mental faculties. Uh, this, however, was not enough. I began to realize that the multiplicity of possible interpretation of a text greatly depends on one particular purview. One can have fundamentally violent reactions to the contents of literature depending on their social, cultural, religious, and philosophical purviews. I began to posit that the system that governs and organizes individuals ultimately depends on those who formed the ideas that created society. I delved into philosophy for the first time. Uh, I had read from Rousseau, Hobbes, and Locke. I dissected passages from the tomes of Augustine, Plato, and Aristotle. I became acquainted with the existentialists, Nietzsche, Camus, sociological structurists, Saussure, Levi Strauss, the post-structuralists, Foucault, Butler, Derrida, Deleuze. After these years of academic productivity, I then sought the philosophies of the East, I've then been exposed to Buddhism and Islam and Hinduism and uh, a multitude of variety of different uh, denominations or subcultures within those domains. Um, and so uh, I've been exposed to Rumi, Dogen, Dogen Zenji, Naruhuna, Zhao Shu, uh, the, from the record of Zhou Shu. Uh, you can look it up as a PDF, all this. Um, he he uh, told me that they, they had taught me about non-duality and, and, and insight. Um, I then studied the markets and the organization of people within the scope of their labor and productivity. While this was happening, I then returned to society, social structures, and institutions as my primary focus of study. Um, I used the teachings of the ancients and those who have come before me to analytically dismantle the dualistic, in dialectical processes of Hegelianism, Marxism, Christianity, something beyond good and evil, as Nietzsche poignantly pr presumed, proposed. These hopes and ambitions were still underway. However, d during the stunning upset in the 2016 United States presidential election, I seemingly lost all hope. Uh, and my thoughts on Donald Trump and all that is just... I, uh, dem demagoguery will always exist as long as there are people who allow it. And, um, this is why philosophy is, is, is an action. It's a mode of being. It's a way of living. It's a, it, it's a life of contemplation and of analysis and reflection. And that is what makes a philosopher uh, not their degree. Um, as what 
many people might assume. In, in some sense, we all are amateur philosophers in a very broad sense. Um, so, okay. And so th there are many ideas in the state of economics that are useful to me to understand, um, as any truly serious thinker does, would. Um, however, the, the, the one truly important answer that I found was that technologies were at the forefront of what is both economically and socially attainable in the material world. Uh, the substance that shifts paradigms and causes revolutions then became indisputably to many as technological advancement, um, like Star Wars and cinematographic te technological advancement and the data science and meticulous computerized sections of research that, for example, allowed uh, Thomas Piketty to write Capital, uh, w which is a brilliant book that, that, that I, uh, on the CSN, I learned Python to intermediate level, give or take, and still trash, honestly, um, as well as understanding algorithms, data structures, databases, and networks. Um, I self-educated by watching countless videos, read multiple textbooks, which is really important. Textbooks are brilliant. Like a good textbook is just so brilliant. Like uh, the O'Reilly textbook for Python, uh, learning Python is just a brilliant textbook that is really like well done, honestly. Um, and so, so now um, uh, and, and I read a uh, copious amounts of secondary literature, and secondary literature is important because it it, it circumvents the the language barrier of, of private intellectuals, private elite intellectuals, and, and the layperson. Um, and, and so secondary literature, you know, thinkers talking about thinkers is, is actually very important. Um, and so now I'm entering a master's degree in computer science after doing my bachelor's in political science and economics at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, I'm at the stage in which I'm realizing that as a serious thinker, the way in which my questions are asked fundamentally shape the possibility of answers I may receive. Refining the philosophical and scientific method, understanding the realm of ideas, and appreciating the immense nuance of navigating the domain of the human and natural sciences will only further embolden our biggest question. What is the nature of our universe? What are the substrates that foundationally form conscious experience? Is language truly biologically innate? Are morals truly relative? Is artificial general intelligence possible? Are nanoscale robotics truly feasible? These are the questions that we should ask. And uh, the true freedom in the 21st century will not be that of attaining wealth or realizing uni universal utopian illusions. The, the political left and right are currently in disarray in the United States, for example, is within this space of openness, I believe, that will lead us to a new era of enlightenment in the information age. With the decline in our faith in the perfectibility of institutions, our political and economic discourses have been dismantled our assumptions of the world and the taxonomies in which the organized fields and disciplines of knowledge remain, uh, bare, remain bare. Our grand meta-narratives of history have been washed away. Many of the seemingly invisible, po seemingly invisible power relations throughout history have been brought to fruition in the public discourse. With seemingly limitless information and billions of data points to systematically analyze the question. The question of the 21st century is not, what will we build? But why? Why should we build it? And what will be its consequences, both materially and metaphysically? How can we feel more human in a world of rationally explained mechanistic systems? What is beyond our deterministic subjectification of ourselves? What are our new ethics for the 21st century in a world of artificial, a world where artificial intelligence and gene editing exist? Why have our technologies and systems of knowledge have extended so far beyond the more nuanced concerns of daily reality? Um, 
we have been thrusted into the throes of post-humanism without even realizing it. The current coronavirus pandemic has massively accelerated the control structures of the elite technology corporations. This new era of the information age then seems to be the, the death of the individual, of both man and woman, uh, not as a species, not even as a species or rational being, neither of, of, of the man as an object or a thing of nature, but precisely man of a purely academic and intellectual sense, an individual of a purely liberal sense, perhaps more specifically the, the classical liberal sense of intellectualism. Um, roughly, f for example, in the United States, 75% of all academic professorships at nonprofit and for-profit universities in the United States, for example, are currently not tenure track, a distinction that enables academics to talk more freely about their thoughts and interests about without fear of prosecution or in instability. In the 21st century, our, our university institutions these same ones that maximize on the profits rather than embracing intellectualism, seemingly, based on the data, are the very places where ideas go to die. Our arts and entertainment and the Zizekian ideologies behind them, of, of which are mostly diffused upon computer screens, have suffered. Uh, many among us would, would, would look upon these devices more than spend a night's in with an ancient tome of wisdom. Historically, as we go through intellectual history, a thinker such as Foucault re revealed to us the way our societies discipline us, uh, internalize those mechanisms of discipline, and create a hegemony of culture. Uh, thinkers like Chomsky have laid out to how our consent is all ultimately manufactured. Uh, the great right-wing libertarian theories have ended exam argument the argument of what a rational agent in the economy should look should look like or be. Um, advancements by Peter Thayer and Nudge Theory have greatly challenged the use case of the rational agent in analytical ends. Uh, na now as we live in what I feel is a, a Deleuzean control society, um, we may finally understand that there, there is no way out other than radical revolution or one where one in which one would want to be free from the fetters of the information age and its tenets that are doubly propounded by financial institutions, governments, and technology institutions. Uh, this is the end, as the post-structuralists naturally assume, the, the death of, of man, perhaps, the death of, uh, of man as, 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 um, in the post-humanist sense. Uh, it, it, in the sense that the culprits um, of the control of the control structures now are now ourselves. We are the culprits. We are the ones inflicting the power structures among ourselves. Why? Why? I will tell you. Uh, the data we produce on a, on a daily basis uh, over the years of our life are all reduced to numbers in a computerized system. Our social securities, our bank accounts, and the number of zeros on the balances of our mortgages. Uh, one's first reaction is to initially engage in a, a Mersoltian uh, revolt. But uh, how can revolt against technologies that are not only useful but necessary in these dangerous times? Um, in the times of coronavirus, technology seems more like an asset than a hindrance, but one may inquire about when the computers own us. There, the truth is the computers are already part of us in so many ways. It is this abstract symbiosis between man and machine where one stares for hours into the abysses of its screen and haunts the very fabric of our being and frightens us, not because it controls us or because we realize that we're too attached to them. The fear is in the mirror. As uh, Nietzsche point, poignantly claimed that if one stares into the abyss, the, the abyss stares into you. 
the truth is that the computer is us in a very metaphysical sense, in a very literal sense. Competing theories for explaining the mind have now been redu uh, reduced to connectionist systems and this is a haunting process. It's something that we uh, have to work on. Um, some of the books I used to make this video were The Sublime Object of Ideology by Slavoj Žižek, Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison by Michel Foucault, Manufacturing Consent by Noam Chomsky, Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman, Postscript on Societies of Control by Gilles Deleuze, and The Stranger by Kim Albert Camus. Um, and so I would like to end this video. Um, and if you'd like, please leave a like. And if you want to see more of these videos, please subscribe. Uh, this is the first time making this video and I'm probably going to leave it more so unedited because I have a lot to do. I'm currently teaching myself like t three programming like three programming languages. <sighs> okay. Also, if you want to um, read more about things that I am saying or things I'm doing, um, check out my blog. Um, I, uh, the, the essay that I, I, I spoke out was maybe two blog posts. So, yeah, but there's a lot of different content on there that you can still watch, so thank you.